I found an email exchange between you and I from four years ago. Really? Yes, and you, you came to do a talk at the BCC and uh, you'd explained all about MLS and the seminars and chiropractic philosophy. And I remember I was two weeks in school and I emailed you. I was like, hey, I really like your talk. I want to come to the seminar, but I've only been in school for two weeks and I don't know, like, is it for me? What, what do you think? And you replied, actually, this is the best time to be here because you don't know, you don't know anything. And it's true, like I went and uh, I went to the seminar thinking, yeah, I'm just gonna crack people. And <laughs> you came in and people were meditating and doing the breath work and the alms and all this stuff. And then we start like learning the, the listings and I'm learning all this language of like, you know, body left, body right. And I don't even know what a body is. I don't know what a spinous is. And I remember doing my adjustment. I, I was speaking with this the other day with Aaron and Aaron was the, he was helping to facilitate. Right. And, uh, you know, he came over and he's like, what's, what's your listing? And I was just listening to what other people and trying to play along, you know, I was like, oh, it's uh, C1 body right. <laughs> and he stood and he's like, C1 doesn't have a body, bro. Right. And I'm like, trying to play it off, you know, I'm like, did I say C1? I meant C2. And in my head, I'm like, I really hope the C2 has a body. But that was my, that was my introduction to MLS. And now here we are four years later and uh i now basically work for work for mls right. and here we are doing an episode so for me it's been an interesting turnaround of events well that's interesting because first of all i want to ask you how's it pan out for you after four years of training with mls um well in my first year i'd done two seminars second year maybe one or i took a year off and then third year fourth year i've been doing them i've done next week in paris will be my ninth uh seminar so yeah I, it's been it's almost like coming home every time i go i i get a little bit more from it and uh, i'll always have fond memories of it because it was my first but that's the case for a lot of chiropractors a lot of people you were their first exposure to the training ethos and a lot of people probably did their first adjustment uh at mls you know so yeah uh many things to piggyback on what you were saying one is you know, is it great to take it when you don't know anything? And the reason I believe it's the best time is because there is no way you can be in your head. You have to be in your senses. You have to be in your intuition. And then it starts to come naturally because there is no preconceived idea of how it should be in your mind. And frequently what we observe is people delivering op op almost perfect adjustment. And then the process is how do you learn to duplicate what happened to you so naturally in the first place? And that may take years because there is so many ingredients, facets, um, specific pieces to put together. And at every seminar, you get one more piece, one more piece, one more piece. So what I observe, there is two kind of people. There is people that want to go, you know, teach it to me quick. I just want to be able to crack a neck, move a vertebrae, whatever they want to call it. And that will lead them to do okay in practice, but it will not bring them to a level of mastery ever. And if you look at the path that people have taken in sports, whether it's martial arts, whether it's tennis, whether it's even music, when people want to climb higher and higher at the highest level of mastery, they always go back to the foundation. So what I have committed to is to teach people the very foundation and to go over the foundation over and over and over. Because what I realized is that within the foundation resides the, subtlety, the subtleties of mastery. And I am committed to people that are willing to take a path of mastery, knowing that it's a long haul commitment. It's not a quick fix. It's not an overnight journey. It's a long haul commitment. But if they're willing to go there, they will end up at the very highest level and becoming extraordinary what I call professional adjusters. Mm -hmm. And you probably know that out of MLS, many of the seminars are sprang forwards and they are led by people that have taken 14, 15, 16 times the seminars that were on my staff. Mm -hmm. And they now have blossomed out and started their own seminar. So it's a very good validation that when people are willing to take the step to build a rock solid foundation 
and not trying to get to the 14th rank of the ladder right away, but to go every rank at a time and make sure you don't miss level four or level five so that you can climb higher and higher. So that's pretty much the path that I've committed to. And this is why I always invite people to come in that know nothing about. And then what we have also observed, because we have had chiropractors that have been 20 years, 25 years in practice coming in, it revives their passion for chiropractic, it revives their excitement, but they had the hardest time because they have so many years of, quote, bad habits to break. To reverse. To reverse, and that's very challenging. Mm. Well, what's it like now that you've, you've had this long career and now you're retired and you can kind of observe more like the fruits of your labor and you see like these other seminars that maybe those guys that are now regarded as the masters and they had maybe they maybe had their first adjustment at one of your seminars like what's it like now to be able to sit back and see your your legacy i guess well that's an interesting question because i had a very strong vision uh, in the mid 80s to write the boat of chiropractic I saw the skills of a profession declining faster and faster because in most schools throughout the United States, Canada, Europe, the people that come to teach are people that didn't make it in practice. As a rule, there is exception. Mm -hmm. So what you have is you have people that did not make it in practice called failures teaching students. Then those students graduate, those that can't make it in practice return back to school and teach. Mm -hmm. So you have failure, teaching failure, teaching failure, teaching failure. And if you look at any other discipline, whether it's sports, music, art, things have in increased, gotten better and better and better. You take the best tennis player in the 1990, it can't make the US team in 2010. Mm. So things have evolved and gotten better. So when I saw that trend in chiropractic, I decided we're gonna reverse this and we're gonna start changing and bringing back a professional training for chiropractors. So in answering your question, I look back at all of those people that were birthed or came out of MLS and are now teaching seminar. I'm very happy about that because the vision that I had is being moved forwards, not only with MLS, but with many other seminars that are bringing back a culture of intense training, of total dedication, total co commitment to the art of chiropractic. And I want to emphasize the art of chiropractic. Mm. It's not a technique. It was never a philosophy, science, and technique. It's a philosophy, science, and art. And what we teach are the components, the essential ingredient of an artist and the artistry of chiropractic so that you can become your own self-expression, but you have this ground foundation mm -hmm. as a springboard for yourself. Sure. And then um, I like what you said about how in most schools it is the people that failed in practice that come back because, well, you, you've got this qualification to be a chiropractor, but you haven't been able to cut it in practice. And fair enough, they got, you have to earn a living. You have to do something. Now, in my opinion, BCC is kind of the exception to that because the people that are teaching are some of the best chiropractors in their respective techniques. Like if you take my neurology teacher, Jordy, he's arguably probably one of the best functional neurologists in in Europe. He doesn't have to teach. He's doing it because he wants to teach. And then we've got like Boo, you know, Boo's in practice. He, he doesn't have to be there. He doesn't need that income, yeah. but he's there because he, he wants to serve and he wants to advance the profession. So, you know, we've got great teachers at the BCC and they're moving things along. But what what advice would you give to students who maybe aren't lucky to be in this place where it's an exception and maybe they're in schools where it's not encouraged as much and they're they're heading in that direction where they're they're not really on the path of mastery what can they do in their own time and what advice would you give them to stay on track well one of the things that i would say is rather than drilling 100 well that are only three feet deep to try to get water drill one well 400, 500, 600,000 meter deep until you get to the water. Uh, because what I see is students dabbling into many different so-called techniques mm -hmm. and never diving deeply into one approach. And I want to emphasize that MLS was never a technique. Mm -hmm. 
it is an approach to adjusting and we apply it to upper cervical, to knee chest, to Gonstead, to full spine, to diversify, but we, uh, we brought ingredients that we are not brought into any of those so-called techniques before. So my advice and my recommendation uh, is to take seminars outside the curriculum to create for yourself a parallel curriculum because unfortunately in many schools they are not teaching the art of adjusting. Yeah. Uh, it's almost a sideline anymore because we are so overwhelmed with a all-encompassing curriculum that is so demanding on the students that there is no time really to practice chiropractic. Yeah. And then, uh, like I, I've spoken to people who, you know, maybe I'm recruiting someone for MLS and I'm like, yeah, you should come to this. And sometimes people complain and they're like, well, you know, I pay the school 10 grand a year. I should learn everything I need to know mm -hmm. in school. That's the way it should be. And I'm like, well, yeah, that, that would be nice. It would be nice if that, if that was how right. this worked and you have a point but it's not the reality. You need to react to the way that things are, not the way that, that ideally that they should be. Correct. And yet, I, for me, I've done a lot of seminars and I kind of try and it, it's, it's like, it's the tax that you have to pay. It's like, if, if you want to be, if you want to be good at this, you're going to have to have like what you said, the, the extra curriculum, you know? Yeah. So the, yeah, the reality is going to a school, you are paying to get a paper you're not paying to get the true experiential reality of practice education. And outside the school, by creating your own parallel curriculum, by attending seminar, that's where you get the true meat of what it takes to be in practice and the reality of practice. So yeah, it's a tax to pay, mm. absolutely. And uh, what about uh, aside from seminars? So like not going to seminars, but just, I mean, the, the day to day when the school is getting you down and you don't know where to go, like what, what are the routines and daily practices that you should be taking part in to, to, to keep the, the juice and keep on the right path? Well, I understand that, you know, in the life of a student, there is so much time spent in school, so much time spent studying that extra available time is available maybe on weekend to go to seminars, but on a daily basis, it's very limited. So I think a commitment of just even five minutes of reading positive chiropractic philosophy, the green books, five minutes a day of spending five minutes a day visualizing the spine, the landscape of the spine, I, spending a few time, even like 10 minutes in meditation a day, but having that discipline to start that discipline early because once you're out of school and your schedule can open up, then you can increase that to a 20 minute daily meditation, to a 20 minute positive reading and diving deeper and deeper into chiropractic philosophy. So to build early discipline, even training, the training or the drills that we teach at MLS, you know, I recommend to do it for a full half an hour every day yeah. when you're in practice. Is it practical while you're in school? Probably not, but do it even five minutes every day. There is a book called The Atomic Habit, and it reveals that you inc if you improve by 1% on one thing, say your speed, 1% every day, at the end of the year, that's 365%. After five years, you're like Bruce Lee yeah. in adjusting, in speed. So take one aspect, improve it by 1% every day. Compression of the tissue, learning to compress properly and to connect. Improve it 1% even every week. Yeah. That's 52%. Yeah. So at the end of the year. And, and really it's the, it's the basic stuff. It's laying the basic, basic foundations. This stuff, it's, it's not complicated really when you think about it. How, how, how do you get good at adjusting the practice reps right. over and over? There's no, like, there's no big secret. The secret no. is practice. You know, even the simple things, it's not that you have to, you know, go on a mission trip to the BCC and adjust a thousand people in the waiting room. It can be as simple as taking time in between classes and how do, how do you, how do you pick up someone's head? Something, something as basic as that. That was our first two weeks of classes with Boo in second year. Okay. We're going to go around the room, change patient doctors, and we're going to learn how to pick up someone's head and get feedback on that. And then for me now, because I travel all over Europe with Danny to help with MLS, and I go to these other schools, and even like 
basic basic foundations like that not even talking about adjusting how do you pick up someone's head and it's stuff that you know if if you've been revisiting this over and over now we kind of take it for granted it's just something that you do and then whenever other people experience it with you they notice the big difference and they're like oh you know where where did you learn that and it's it's doing the the small things over and over again and laying the foundations yeah totally i mean in sport you know you look at nba players it's not like they show up for the game they train weeks after week day after day for hours and hours and the people at the very top train even more than the rest of the team and that's a mindset that we have injected in mls is get committed to your trade i mean being a chiropractor you know you adjust people's spine which is the very core of their being and you got to be really really excellent at it not just average not normal not poor adjuster become extraordinary and that takes refinement of acquiring all of the little simple detail as you say picking up a head and how to d apply that kind of pressure that unloads the cervical and cause them to be weightless mm -hmm. so that now they're so easy to move at peace. so and at peace and to track the you know the neurospinal system the meningeal system so all of those things to me i mean as a student of chiropractic it's like how can you not be excited to do this you know if you're a basketball player and you want to play in the nba you know you're in love with that ball you're in love with your your you shoes you can't, uh, there was a there was a coach in nba that took that team and i don't can't remember the name of the coach Carter, coach Carter. maybe that took the team to the very highest level and he spent the first two days i think teaching the nba player how to lace their shoes and they were like dude i'm I'm getting like multi-million dollar contract and you're teaching me how to lace my shoes? Yeah. And you guys, yep, that's where we're gonna start. Yeah. Basic foundation. How to pick up someone's head. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so say you have these people, maybe they're in the training, the, the, the MLS you seminar culture, and they're in school and they're getting the philosophy, but what I've come to see is, is the school is a bubble like w here at the BCC, we're, we're in a bubble of, of like-minded people. What would you say for people that then, and I've, I've seen this happen, they, they graduate and they go off into their community and now you're alone and you're not every day with those like-minded people. And you know, maybe you're doing a couple of seminars a year. If even that, sometimes people, they graduate and they're like, okay, now I know everything that I need to know. I'm comfortable with my technique or my approach, it's not a technique. Right and and they they just kind of stagnate they they just hit that plateau and then i've seen the other ones that over the years they're they're always uh getting better like what would you say to those guys that kind of finish go out into the community and then they kind of dwindle away and get a little bit lost what how do they keep on track mm -hmm. so what's interesting about what you bring about is when i started doing mls in i think 1984 it was actually for me a platform to teach the philosophy because I was so committed to the importance of the philosophy and I was giving seminars on philosophy, but there was like 20, 30 people showing up. Mm. And I thought for what did some... What you talk about? What would you have done with the philosophy? Like what kind of stuff were you... Well, I, I would have a weekend seminar on chiropractic philosophy oh, yeah. and I would teach all of the different ingredients of chiropractic philosophy, the building stone, uh, the cornerstone of that philosophy. But people were not interested in it, even though they were chiropractic students. So when I decided to do MLS, I said, oh, everybody want to learn about technique. So I'm going to do a, an adjusting seminar and infuse it with a philosophy. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we have affected and influenced and impacted thousands of chiropractors because I brought the philosophy from the practical reality of practice. How do you communicate it to the public? And what I would want to say to those chiropractors that have graduated is, indeed, when you're going to go into your community, suddenly you are out of the bubble of the school yeah. and you're encountering an enormous multi-programming by the media. So the consciousness of people that come to you with a programming into the medical symptom crisis oriented model, yeah. mechanistic model of life. And suddenly you're swimming upstream, constantly upstream. As a matter of fact, Boo was sharing with me, there was a woman that did a talk and she she said, you know, in the ocean, there is shark and there is salmon. The sharks is a medical profession. Chiropractors are salmon. And shark can eat salmon. But the one thing that's interesting about salmon, 
is they can swim upstream, yeah. upstream, upstream ag against tremendous odds. You have to become a salmon in chiropractic. Yeah. You have to have rock solid foundation to be so grounded, so centered that you can face the onslaught of the consciousness, which is a prevailing wisdom of today, which is unfortunately a dying model. Yeah. Or rather, fortunately, a dying model. Yeah. And the emerging model is a vitalistic, proactive, well being care model which chiropractic has a wonderful handle on. Yeah, and that, well, that's been the experience for me, is that I said before, MLS will always be a home for you. So it's not that you go and you do MLS and you only use that approach. Come, pick some stuff up from it. And then especially as a student, we're learning Gonstead, SOT, Toggle, Thompson, everything. Go and do all that, and that's what I'm doing. But it's nice every couple of months to come back and revisit it and um an analogy that i think i got it from danny and it really stuck with me is he says the first time you go to mls it's like you take a picture on this camera and you can kind of see the outline of what's going on and then every time you come back the picture gets a little bit clearer so these guys that have been to many many seminars whether it's mls or not and they keep coming back it, now the picture is pretty clear and every time it's just refining it and I've been a lot of times now, but whenever I go, it's not that I'm um, like I know I know most of it by now. But I'll go and I'll get maybe one or two small, tiny uh, tweaks, and over time, those tweaks start to build up, and that's what makes the difference. Yeah, and you know, one thing about this is that you get one tiny little tweak, right? But you look at a tennis player like Rafael Nadal. The coach may say, you know, just slightly shift the position of your wrist. Yeah. Transform the game to a win. So it is those small refinement put together over time that create extraordinary chiropractors and extraordinary adjusters. So, yeah, to me, the, the whole journey is so f exciting because there is always a new discovery. Mm -hmm. And as you say, every time you come, it deepens what you already have acquired but then you pick up the next piece. Mm. And my analogies have always been the first MLS, you get the alphabet or some of the alphabet. Second MLS, you start to put some words together. Mm. By the third MLS, you put some sentence, but you're not speaking the language by any means. Right. By the fourth, fifth, sixth, you start to understand the conversation, but you're not still fr not fluent in the language. Mm. By 10th, you start to be fluent, but you're not into the poetry of it. That's where MLS two comes in, and now we are moving into soon MLS 3 because I had a very specific vision with MLS, which is to bring back all of the component of adjusting that was done in the mid 80s that were absolutely extraordinary and transformed people at a very high level, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And that is my commitment. At the time when this form of adjusting came about in the mid 80s, the profession was not mature enough to handle it because to have we're more ready. I think more and more people now are maturing the profession is maturing consciousness is evolving the public is even more ready um, so at MLS 3 we want to teach really like what I consider the maturity of the art of chiropractic and what will it be art will it be a technique or will it be more of a it's philosophy it, is it, it adjusting no it's it's a metaphysical and physical part of the adjustment right. it is also specific sequence in adjusting to learn to read the body to apply specific sequence for that particular individual mm. combining meningeal soft tissue and structural adjusting in specific sequences specific to that individual individual specific in that moment so, so that's that's where the poetry of chiropractic comes in. And now that the it's kind of ac accum accumulating in this, like MLS three is the first I've heard about it. Have you spoke about this with other people? Or no, I mean, they, I suppose so. This is like the this is like the involved. debut. Okay, Correct. there we go. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, but for for you, you started this in the mid eighties. The other day I was in the, the supervisor room and someone said, oh, you know, I was at the first Cairo Europe. And I'm like, you're at the first one? Because now it's this huge event. Right. I says, what was it like? And she said, well, it was, it's, it was basically a bar 
in Malaga, <laughs> and there was maybe 20 chiropractors, you know, meeting up. And Mark Hudson was standing on the table, and he was saying, like, you can do more. And, and, and that was the humble beginnings of the, the first Cairo Europe. That's where it came from. And I wanted to, to ask, do you remember much of the first MLS? Oh, What's yeah. your recollection of it oh, compared yeah. to what it is now, where there's hundreds of people turning up? Like, but I was in Paris. I was in your last seminar in Paris. And w what was it like to, to come from the beginning? Let's talk a little bit about that, to come full, full circle. circle, you know? Well, when you create something in life, when you birth something, my belief is that you have to have laser, laser sharp focus. You have to virtually cut a steel plate with a laser so the early seminars people showed up one second late they were not allowed to participate they were given a choice either you can sit for the next two days and observe or you can go home so we turned a lot turn away a lot of people that came in late because they said oh well i just show up you know yeah. or i, I come in it, i know. come in and out of the room and whatnot. i was so strong on creating a new culture a professional culture if you're a professional athlete and your team is training you're not showing five minutes late ten minutes late you are there early and you're on time when we start with all your equipment so it was ironclad discipline the training was so intense we just absolutely crushed people for them to realize this is the intensity that you have to bring to the game mm. So those were the early times. And once a field is created and the field has opened up, you can soften that approach. But we still bring a very strong commitment to every seminar. As you know, having participated, we laid out the commitment for the next two days. But now it's a softer approach because you don't need to do it at that level. It's when you start something, there is a very strong intensity that come with it. Um, so yeah and coming full circle in Paris, and I don't know if you know that, but I started, I stumbled into chiropractic at my chiropractic's office, mm. 76 Rue Bonaparte. And when I did the seminar in Paris, which is the only seminar I ever did in France in my 40 years, really? there was the largest attendance ever. And I was asked on Facebook to speak to a group of chiropractor. And guess where it was? Mm. 76 Rue Bonaparte. You could not have made that happen if I wanted to. I could not have said, you know, I'm going to yeah, come to I'm Paris. Gonna I'm going to give a seminar and please make sure that I'm going to speak to this group of chiropractors and students and it's 76 Rue Bonaparte. Wouldn't have happened. Yeah. So I knew that I had completed the full circle and that the universe had validated like basically and confirmed yeah. you're done with that part of your life. And I've passed on the seminar to senior staff and they're doing excellent at teaching. Yeah. Um, with that um, hardcore mentality that you brought to the game, like that's extreme. That's very congruent being like, if you arrive late, you're out. I don't yeah. care, I don't want to hear it. But you tend to find when people, when they have that late, now I don't think I'm quite that harsh, but I often find when, when you are blunt with people and you're quite severe, you tend to clash a lot, but like how how would you talk about that? Where you want to be congruent and you want to you want to be a hard ass on people, but also at the same time, I'm kind of too nice and maybe I don't want to rub people up the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So whether it's with other chiropractors where you're kind of calling them out on their bullshit, or with patients when maybe the patient wants to dictate their own care and all, oh, you know, I just want to come in whatever I want, and you 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 have to kind of have your line in the sand, and sometimes you do have to be an asshole. But then you also want to be the nice guy. You don't want to be regarded as an asshole. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. It's a very vague, long-winded question. but <laughs> Right. So that approach to me is what I call tough love. I'm not for gooey love. You know, can I give you a Kleenex? Do you need some water? Can I put some lemon in your water? Are you comfortable now with everything, every little thing? And, and uh, oh, is the seat okay? Do you want a cushion? You... No. This is gooey love. I'm all about tough love. And tough love come, I want the best. I want to squeeze the best lemon juice out of that person. And if it means telling them you were one second late, mm. you're not coming into that room, or you sit for two days watching the seminar. And to this day, I have people that have emailed me or called me and said, I was kicked out of your seminar. It's the best lesson I've ever learned. And then I came back sometimes six months later to your seminar, and it transformed my life. 
So I believe that tough love, when it comes from the right place, and it came inside me yeah. not from a controlling place, not from a dictatorship place, but from a place, you want to be part of this. I want you to be show up at your best. Yeah. And that's going to start by you being on time yeah. and being respectful of the environment, of the dojo that you step into. Yeah. You know, in, I did martial arts throughout my young years, and there is tremendous respect in martial art. You bow to the space, you respect your teachers, right. you are on time. So uh, that's pretty much what I injected into the seminar early on, and I kept that tough love in my teaching. Uh, you know, I'm not like, oh, you know, I know you are slow, so, you, you know, no. You, you need to train. You need to train. Okay, it's not going to happen today. I guarantee you that it's not going to happen today. But you need to train. You start doing 100 push-ups a day. In three months, you come back to that seminar. Your speed is going to be lightning speed. Yeah. So tough love. Yeah. And I think to to be able to accept that the that feedback, you need to be able to drop your ego. You know, so like with me and my friend, my flatmate Louise, who does the RCD stuff with me, uh, he will be very harsh on me. But sometimes I need someone, I need someone to call me out and then I have to drop the ego and be like, okay, actually you're right. Whereas, you know, a lot of people, if, if the ego kind of gets the better of them, they don't want feedback. They don't want even, you know, I've had times someone's like hunched over to do a cervical adjustment right. and I'll come behind and playfully, not even in a, in a horrible way. I'll just be like, bend your knees, man. Like keep your back straight. And they'll be like, leave me alone. Like piss off like I don't care about what you think and the, it's because they've been called out on something that really they should be doing at this stage and they, they the ego won't let them accept any constructive feedback whereas whenever you speak this is what I found anyway whenever you speak to the true masters they'll take feedback from anyone and it's not that you have to take it to heart and you have to get offended by it but if you get constructive feedback you say oh thank you whether you take it on board or not, and that's something that I've noticed between the guys that are average chiropractors and when you look at the ones that are like great, whether it's in adjustments or whether it's in business, the ego can be a, a part of it and it can get you so far. But when it comes to that feedback and like what you're saying with the seminar and ha having someone to call you out on your bullshit, sometimes you are going to have to, to drop the ego. And I think that's an important lesson that MLS taught me and a lot of other people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, over the years, when you're in a position like mine, teaching, uh, and then people look at you as, you know, a prominent figure or whatever way they see you, for me, I understand that they come from that place, but I also like, like to level the playing field. Like, no, I'm still in the game with you. I participate in everything with you, and as you know, during the training, I do everything that the part that I demand of the participant because I believe if I teach it, I'm able, I got to be able to do it. So I won't demand of somebody some things that I don't demand of myself. And that being said, I have always said to my staff, please call me out on my stuff because I can't see my own stuff. So please call me out when you see it. That's the only way I can grow and evolve. So I think that piece is very correct and you know bj always say you have to become a hollow bone mm. you have to become nothing in order to become everything and i think that's what we have to strive to in life as a chiropractor as a facilitator of the healing process is to really dissolve into virtually a state of i'm just a vehicle to do this but i've trained to the best of my ability to bring the best to the table so i think it's very true that towards the teaching and towards the seminar, people are confronted with their own ego and it becomes a mirror for themselves to grow. And you so can use that as something that you're going to push through or you can resist against it. Exactly, like exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's something I've seen, like that's the difference. And I think, um, well, I mean, share something personal, but I think I have a component of that because I find that when I'm adjusting on my own in the, in the clinic as an intern and there's no one there, the adjustments go fine. I'm pretty happy. As a fourth year, I think I'm a decent adjuster. When I'm in MLS and I'm, uh, you know, I have the assessor, the, the facilitator beside me, especially if it's Danny, you know, and I share this, you know, to make myself vulnerable because maybe I can help someone else. But because he's basically, he's like my boss and he, he's almost like 
like the the older brother that you want like i i want him to be like yeah zarek's a good adjuster like zarek's cool but maybe that's a little bit of the ego because i'm like as soon as you want the adjustment i i have to admit do a good job because i want to be known as the the good adjuster and i've never been able to do good adjustments <laughs> while i'm being i get too in my head because i'm thinking about the other person not about the person in front of me on the table yeah so i'll share something very personal about this when i started teaching mls i encountered the same process because in my practice it was magic and then I was teaching the component, uh, breaking down all of the components that I used in practice. And then when it was time to demonstrate, I felt the pressure of everybody watching me. Mm-hmm. And then I put a lot of pressure on myself and got in my, in my own way. In After a num- yeah, in my head, in my own way. After a number of seminars, I was able to completely dissolve that. But check this out, still to these days, if somebody comes in and say, oh, I heard, oh, you're on a journey, I heard, can you adjust me? I get in, still today, I get into my own ways. Wow. But if people don't know anything about me, so we all have a level of vulnerability. Right. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's a lot of pressure when people say, oh, here is Rafael Nadal, he's going to play, you know. Uh, it's a lot of pressure on those people because everybody is watching. Are you going to succeed or are you going to fail? And I've seen Rafael Nadal about a year ago being absolutely destroyed, destroyed. Uh, it was horrible defeat. It can happen, but we have to recognize that even your best teachers are human and they also have their weaknesses and their challenges. So it was. I'm glad you brought that mm-hmm. point up because, yeah, when you're under the limelight, and the light of the world watching you it's a lot of pressure mm. well uh thank you for sharing that and i think that's probably gonna wake up a lot of people there you go if if arno and he's regarded as this great adjuster and the kind of the father of the modern training movement would you agree um and if he's still getting in his head to to do an adjustment I don't know if you could close with anything better than that. <laughs> we probably just uh, yeah. wrap it up there with yeah. that statement. But if there's anything else that you that you want to say, thank you very much for for taking the time and and sharing, especially that you know. And I think it'll help a lot well, of people. Zarek, thank you for coming over and doing this interview. And the only thing I I want to say to people listening to that video is fall in love with chiropractic, fall in love with the game, commit to the game, go all out and stay on the path, don't falter, stay on the path.